<laughs> All right. My name is Rachel Woody, and I'm here with Della and Chuck Henderson, mm -hmm. and it is June 12th here at their home. And my first question for you, Chuck, is why wine? Well, you know, I've always thought about that because I've read quite a little books on it, and we, uh, we started we started to plant some Pinot Noir at Dr. Clore, who was the father of the wine industry in this state, as you probably know. Mm -hmm. He was the one that helped me get started. He brought some down. Would, we had uh, the Birch Demeanor, which I grew, and uh, again my Beaujolais, which uh, Dr. Uh, the other doctor. Well, anyway, no, where, doctor? Uh, where, where was he? Uh, right, you see, at, at the process station? Yeah. I, can't, I only know of Dr. Clore. Yeah, I asked him, I said, well, the gamay we can't get legally. He said, go, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't know, I'll tell you, we don't print it. <laughs> He said, well, he said, I got a bunch over there, and if they were going to question me, I was going to tell them they were for read instruments. Mm -hmm. He said, but they never questioned me, so I, got, I just brought them over. <laughs> he was, a, he was a, that kind of fellow, always had a twinkle in his eyes, and uh, they were nice people. Mm -hmm that I knew when we started, they were ever, ever, very helpful. Dr. Clark used to come down on Sundays because he had a daughter in uh, going to school in, I think, Eugene or Portland. And uh, he'd go down and visit her, but he'd stop in going and coming back. <laughs> and uh, he was very helpful. And he wasn't like a lot of professors today with their nose up in the air, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. He was a down-to-earth person. And I didn't know at the time when he was doing all this work, he had cancer in his jaw. Never said a word until it was quite late, just before he died. And I heard that. I never realized. I know he had his mouth packed, but it, uh, he didn't like to talk about it. It was going to be fatal, you know, and, but he worked hard. He's one of the hardest working men I ever knew. He didn't seem to forget a word you said or anything that he got in the for the for the wine group, he would bring everything to us. He was just a great fellow. Without him, we wouldn't have had a wine industry. Uh, because the wine industry is very. general fighting, backbiting going on, and he kept that down. Mm. And uh, that was a great, that was a great, his ability to make people work together. Mm. There was no question in my mind without him, there was no one else who would have ever got it done. And so, uh, I didn't see him in the last year as much, but I'll always remember the man. He had a, and then his friend there, there was, was also a doctor up there at the, at the food science. He, but it was, they were a little different. One guy was kind of a, We laugh at jokes and stuff like that. You tell them to. <laughs> and uh, 
and Dr. Carr was a very serious person. It took a while to get to know him, but he, uh, I remember one time, there was a meeting, that, there was three of the people from there, and me sitting at a table and eating, and I asked him, I said, can you tell me what the word CB I remember it, 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 in German it's, it's spelled different and in translation you wouldn't know that but any anyway, what that word that had me stumped was um, reflective index and they use a German term in their book. This man spent a whole life working on that one book, Temperatures Above the Ground. I've got one of the few copies that ever got over here. That it, it, it helped me very much in relating why they like to go grind on it. Wine grapes on southern slopes is because the reflective index, in other words, the heat coming back from the ground. I never fully understood that until I knew the fellows. It was an enjoyable time. I really enjoyed going up there and working with them because they were very forgiving of my pronunciations of names and they never they never you know, corrected you because I don't know they were just that way mm -hmm. and uh, anyway that one I never found out from them because they said I never heard of it the three of these guys all doctors and uh, I found an old dictionary that was you know, the old ones are about that thick who you think it, you'd see a German word in it? It, it, it said that it, is, it was. I gotta slow down. When they used to tell me a word, and I'd have to look it up, and I it could, never did figure that out for. I think after quit, it, it means the reflective index of heat from the soil. And that, that was the reason for planting on, on uh, South Slope because they needed to that. And if you tried to raise those early bearing grapes, if you put them on a north wall or a place where it's hot enough, then there was no flavor. You had to have that cool nights and because uh, up there where I was, when the sun went down, the cool air would come down and cool it off. And soon the sun come up, boy, they, it was warm. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got that reflective heat, which was needed. And uh, anyway, that's one of the things he told me about that I always remember. <laughs> and. Uh, He, 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 both of those doctors were very good, and uh, we don't have any left like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, the passing of those groups. It's all high power stuff, and that's why I think we have St. Michelle and a lot of little wineries. Because they had the money to buy the people in to work. Oddly enough, you can put that down that St. Michelle gave us a lot of help when we were starting. I know one year I had a kind of brush on my heart and I wasn't feeling very good, and they were going to send a little crew down. But I said, no, I said, I got enough neighbors who will come and help me. And, uh, they did help me, and uh, Dr. Clara and Dr. Well, I almost know his name, but I can't pronounce it. I always remember a man with a twinkle in his eyes. <laughs> and 
that's all there now. <laughs> that's all I want to say now until you ask me some more questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll ask you the second one. And why did you come to this why area? Why did you choose this area? Yes. The area choose me. <laughs> I just happened to be there. Before I, I was born in North Dakota, I never lived there much. But I went back to North Dakota when I started farming. I had a fellow that in real estate that helped me a lot getting land up there. And uh, he always backed me. And. Uh, But planting grape tree got a lot of hostility up there. Oh, you can't raise grapes here. Well, I wasn't trying, but I was experimenting. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Dr. Clark really was the one that came and suggested that this was an area yeah. so much like the area in Germany, which he was so familiar with. Most of your land but is as, up here. as far as coming here, I can explain that we we were in North Dakota was shortly after we got married. He had the fall before come from Wisconsin and bought farms in North Dakota. One of the farms that he had bought, the individual had come to White Salmon. And he didn't like it. He was kind of did some logging. I don't think he was a very responsible person. I don't think he was ever a very good grain farmer in North Dakota either from the looks of it. But anyhow, he was back that summer wanting his farm back and wanting to work out an exchange and such. And I had just had our first child, Charles, who's uh, 54 now. And I said, well, you know, I really kind of know the area because I had worked in Portland for some time and I had relatives there and before we were just when we got married I had been in Seattle for five years working and so I said if you think it's okay you know so he came out on the train and anyhow they were out some an exchange that get his farm back and and so we came here in November of 61 and we, there was a lot of land here. Some of it was in cherry orchard, pear orchard. We put in more cherry orchard, but we re really needed to develop more land. The previous to that had just raised hay on some of those. So then it was Dr. Clark that suggested that gave us the test plot, the grapes to start a test plot uh, of a vineyard. And from the test plot, we selected Pinot Noir and Gewürztraminer and Gamay. We had Riesling and other things planted, too, in the test plot. But that's what we selected and put our vineyard into. And what year was that? It must have been, I don't know, when did we start planting? We, oh. bo we bonded in... 76, but when did we start planting grapes? Must have been, the test plot must have been what? 86, 68, 69? When and then, did we move to Richmond? Well, we moved here in November of 61. No, and we were in Richmond first. You see, you're mixed up. We were in North Dakota, you were in New Richmond, and we, then we were in North Dakota when we got married. Yeah. And we moved here in November of 61. Okay. So, right. And I think we bonded the winery, what, in 76. So, I don't know, must have been like 60s or... Yeah, I remember. Or about probably in 70 or 71 then we planted the vineyard. Were started. Yeah, I remember planting some grapes early when he got there, but 
They weren't very good. Well, some of them didn't do good. We selected the ones to grow that did good. Some no, of them but, that... Uh, that uh, let me say something. Dr. Clore gave me a selection of five grapes. And uh, we planted them up there on a slightly southern slope. And uh, out of those, I picked the Gewurztraminer and the Pinot Noir because they were the earliest grapes. Later, I put some Gamay Beaujolais. I told you about that. <laughs> and uh, they weren't much different than the Pinot Noir. They actually, they are a form of Pinot Noir, but they're earlier and they don't have that sharp bite. And I used the Pinot Noir to make champagne. And in the champagne, I wouldn't pay too much attention because my son had come home and he didn't want anything to do with it. So, in 80, 81 and 82, I had made Champagne, the, no, 80 and 80, 80. I mean, one of those two anyway, I had planted some grapes and they looked pretty good. And they found that the Gerch demeanor actually came from a part of Alsace-Lorraine, Alsace up in the northern part, and they raised them there. So I kept, I got that, and it was one of my favorite wines. It's a very nice wine if you don't get it too ripe. If it gets too ripe, it gets harsh. But if you pick it around 21% bricks, then it was soft. It did make a nice wine, and, uh, and that, the Pinot Noir, and the Gerwitz Germier was the grapes I raised there. Uh, yeah, that was my... I did have another white grape, but... I didn't, it didn't, you know something, I got a Russian grape. You couldn't eat the stuff, drink it, I mean, it, it was horrible. I don't need a rush to get love it. <laughs> and uh, I dumped that right away. <laughs> Another fellow, when he heard I was getting, oh, he, got, he got quite a, anyway, he got awfully arrogant and demanded part of him. So he sent his wife down, she thought he was going to get half of him. <laughs> I uh, just give her 12 foot cuttings. <laughs> she was mad, he was mad. Never even talked to me afterwards. But they were mine. They didn't have to. But he had a lot of mouth power. <laughs> you find that in all groups of people. And uh, I know he didn't do anything with them. They were fair grapes, not too bad. And if I'd, I used to let them give me two grapes, and they were harsh. And then uh, when I expanded it, I expanded the Gewurztraminer and the Pinot Noir. And then, yeah, and that's right, the Gewurt, I was thinking, yeah, there was three. Really, two grapes, uh, and they seem to do good in that area. And uh, I know when they make contests, when you know Dr. Dor, they they make they made all these wines, you know, and I always got a top number. <laughs> And uh, which didn't do my popular good. It's a jealous group of people. If you don't believe me, you've never been in it. <laughs> but uh, 
I kind of dropped out of the group after then. My son didn't want to go into it much. And he would be willing to raise the grapes, but he didn't want to do anything else. And big day, the big problem in those days was the grapes were cheap and the wine was high. So I, I, I had to I had to make wine to keep up going. You couldn't because they were selling about two hundred fifty to three hundred and fifty dollars a ton. Now they're about a hundred two hundred dollars a ton. Yeah, yeah. And now some of the grapes are selling for five. Five. Well, it's over a thousand, about a thousand. And the pinots are selling about twelve hundred dollars now. What they are now, I don't know. I haven't been reading much about it because I don't have any. But uh, I thought it was a good crop to raise because it come in the fall. And uh, I had cherries that come in June, late June and early July. So it gave me a good, good uh, spread in time. And uh, you've got to have so much labor. And if you have to have it all, if they all ripened once, you couldn't do it. <laughs> We had uh, different times, and I don't know. I'm not too sure what they're doing now, but I know Pino is one of the grapes that is still one of the leading grapes here, and uh, the Gewurztraminer's just growing quite a little. And then the Gamay Blue, the Gamay, they've quit because the people got the organ. Had a law you can't make you can't make it was, the friction down there was terrible, mm. and, and so uh, I couldn't really call them P converts to meter, but they're very they were same grape a little earlier ripening is all, but uh, it was it was nice grape because it was easy to grow, he's very resistant to mildew, and uh, it would have been a great grape if we could have used the term, but Oregon, you couldn't sell it in Oregon, and Washington wasn't too interested in it, so it kind of shut us off, but that's a very good grape. It made a nice was not a harsh wine. Now, my, my, mine was, uh, see what is the, I don't think there was a, 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 a in order of the Gamay Bosley, was just Gamay Bosley. In Pinot, there's about five or six different clones. And uh, the Pinot Noir, where I lived, used to come out a little bit of harsh. It was great to make champagne because it had a stronger base and uh, you, you would soften up and uh, soften just means less acids. Mm -hmm. And it was, I, I like to get wine. And uh, I always make some just put in the same label. <laughs> but I never sold it. Mm -hmm. But uh, and then uh, well, it was fun. It was fun. First thing I ever done in my life that was hard work and done, done fun. It was fun. And uh, that's something to say. 
and mine was uh, was uh, I think it was an early clone, and maybe he gave it to me because he thought well it was pretty good in my place, but is in making wine. It, it, it was difficult in other areas where you got too high of bricks, mm -hmm. and the uh, sugar was very high, and that made it, uh, that makes a harsh wine. And uh, you had to pick it earlier. Did you get right, Ella? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. The, the Peter, the, that Gamay Beaujolais was an earlier grape than than uh, Pinot Noir yeah. there. You know, Pinot Noir was the last one to ripen. and we mm -hmm. always picked the other two. Had the other two picked first, and you know, and uh, and the fermenters and the winery. Yeah, how is it like? What was it all since then? How have you observed the wine industry? Well, I was only in the wine industry for, for about eight, nine years. At that time, I sold the farm, and I, I, I moved back to was no, mm -hmm. up here in, uh, to White Salmon. Um, if we could take a break, actually, I'd like to ask Della mm -hmm. what it was like, what you were involved in on your side of the wine industry. Well, <clears throat> actually, um, you know, as far as starting the vineyard, uh, like I said he got the gray, got the test plots from from Dr. Clore, and he he did all the work, you know, getting it started. I never physically worked in the vineyard. Uh, uh, not. I had a, was had a full time full time position at the two hospitals where I did the anesthesia for the two hospitals, and I was on call all the time. So I did the book work for it and all the reports for it. As the children grew up, they had to they they helped and worked helped him with tying grapes and things out in the vineyard. Then they started the winery and it was more work there again. I didn't go down and physically help with the crush and, and do work down in the cellar. But I again took, all, took care of all the book work there and uh, we hired women in the tasting room and we were fortunate to over the years to have some really committed, nice people. And I saw that that was staffed and cleaned and basically, but that was kind of all, mm -hmm. all I did. I, I didn't really physically work in the cellar or in the vineyard. I just helped see that the money was there to do the payroll and, and did that part of it, but not physical but I did work we both we both worked long hours I guess and and um, didn't take basically <laughs> didn't take any vacation for years what can I say because we it, we got to, it got to the point when our son didn't felt he didn't want to stay and in it that he wanted to do something else and he basically needed to get out of it. We helped him. He went on to school and got a degree in his bachelor's degree in nursing. And uh, then we, it, it got so, we had to, you know, we were hiring so much help that we really weren't making any money. We were just employing people. And so when we had a decent offer, felt a decent offer for the for the pl place, it was a little over 300 acres of property, and there's still a land, a land there to be developed. 
that that we sold and because we just simply couldn't keep up with the work was the reason we left. I was back through there last summer and I was surprised the amount of grapes they're growing in Wisconsin now. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be all over, well, mid-state down. <laughs> uh, you have an interesting question here. What is the Oregon-Washington relationship like? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, in the early years, the relationship was, yeah, was good, good because we started, mm -hmm. Erath and Fuller, you know, were, were they start well, Erath mounted the year after us, and Fuller, you know, they were the, those early Oregon wineries. Uh, um, Actually, I was so, the fifth or sixth winery in the state now. I, how many are there now? Oh, there is. I think we're up to 500. What? 500. Yeah, I just read recently, uh, you know. When uh, I started in St. Michelle and one or two other ones up in, in Washington, we're in. And uh, some of them merged and were, were, were bought out by St. Michelle. St. Michelle in the younger days were very nice. What they are now, I cannot say because I don't have anything, but they were, they did have a champagne press and they, they, were, they said they had to have something for cause when they sell it, they had to have a markdown or something. So they, they waited a year and then they, Got a fully automatic. Uh, oh, they, there's all kinds of little, just tons of machines you can buy now. <laughs> Some with different names, but uh, they were very nice then. And uh, it was a new industry, and there wasn't the feeling of hurry up and meet your neighbor, mm -hmm. which is very common today because I get the foot over and I can tell. <laughs> and uh, that's taken that one park out that I liked so much. I was secretary of the, one of the wine, bigger wineries for a while, but I told him I didn't like it. So said, I'm not a writer. I mean, I'm not a person to follow. The, 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 you know how things back and flow. And was, I was a secretary in the Diamond Fruit. And uh, do they, what do they call their winery over here now? Uh, for Diamond Fruit, I'm not sure. Hmm? Uh, that, I don't know, Diamond Fruit. Diamond fruit is still diamond fruit. Oh yeah. Yeah, and in Hood River, I mean, they they handle only fruit. They don't handle grapes. But they didn't raise any grapes. They ne no, they've never handled grapes. We sold our fruit there, but they they've never diamond fruit has never handled grapes. Yeah. It has though. There's a lot of grapes planted in the Hood River Valley, and a lot of wineries. So, you know, really. They had a little machine because they did press grapes, I think, for some of the growers. Can I ask you number 10? Who were some of the early winemakers and grape growers in the area? What? <laughs> what, what who were some of the early winemakers and grape growers that you remember when you got started? Well, mine was uh, you know, R and Gewürztraminer. Now they found some very, very early strains of the Chenin Blanc. They're growing quite a little Chenin Blanc. And uh, I don't know if they knew that. About the actual growers and winemakers. Don Graves over at Dallas Port started grapes. Yeah. At the first, different variety. He, had, he put in a test plot of different varieties. 
like different than here and Dr. Clark got Don Gravestar too. I don't know if you've talked to Don. He's in Dallas Port. I see him tomorrow. Oh, do you? Yeah. Right. Yes, right. And yeah. he he yeah. is still growing some grapes. And one I know he is still growing and selling is well, the Maybe Beaujolais. Uh, mm. Right. Oh, it's a free grape. There's another fruit grape that's growing in the, the wine de pop, meaning the wine of the Pope. Mm -hmm. and that's the main wine in that one. It's a nice, it's, it's very nice if it's warm enough, but I could never grow them here, but over in the Dells it's a lot warmer. And they've done a pretty good job. And uh, I really like the wine we made from them. They were good, but I couldn't have raised them over like salmon. And then, what, uh, yeah, no, and then one of the next, not as early, but once we started here, is Rick Insminger up on Underwood. Yeah. I got Gavert's Tremainer and you know, our cuttings from it. And actually, uh, I don't really know who, I, Rick and Jody, I don't think, actually own the vineyard, but he's done all the work. I was, oh, it was a doctor that bought the place, doctor from Seattle, and Rick started, worked for him, started management. I don't quite know, but I know he is. He and his sons are the ones that take care of it and, and, and raise very good good, very, really very good grapes. He's, there are, you know, are some others, but Rick is one of the that kind of next that kind of started raising grapes after after we were established. Yeah. So he got his cuttings from me. Yeah, he got his cuttings yeah. from us, yes. Yeah, yeah. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, oh, uh, Dick Agrath and, and Bill Fuller were ones of that time in Oregon, uh, of the, maybe they're a bit of the of the er, of the so to speak early ones. They were getting started about the time we were, and uh, and in the early years, you know, uh, as far as the wine festivals that we went to, the first one that we went to over in the Tri Cities. For the big Tri Cities Wine Festival, well, they started that. I think there were like ten wineries there from Washington and Oregon, and uh, the like. Our children and Bill Fuller's children and Preston's and the, the, well, we all had kids about the same age, and they had a ball all the time at the night before party out at Preston. That was. You know, because it was such a small group, and you knew everyone. Then, as over the years, as things changed, and yeah. and uh, you know, so many, you just yes, we were all together then, and we were all competitive. But as there were more and more wineries formed, it, you you just didn't have that relationship, and that's what I really missed as the time went on was was that um, you really kind of didn't get to know the people who had the wine ran of course then so many people with really big money have come in and uh, and you know that's what competition is well but I mean you know some really huge people have come in and, and bought acres and what was it I just read in the paper about Someplace in Oregon, someone yeah. is coming and putting it going to. I can't yeah. remember which. Oh, Amity, Amity. Oh, yeah. Someone, yeah. someone has just bought Amity, and they were one of the earlier. Uh, yeah. Probably not. A, they, they came after Erat, but they, but but he, oh, oh, what's his name? He was Myron one of Redford. Myron Redford was one of the early ones in Oregon too, and and we got to know, you know. Yeah, real well, too. 
And may I ask you... It's what was the next one. Hey, what is the region known for? Or how do you mark your wine? What is this region's identity, identity in the wine industry? Well, uh, they, did a lot, lot, they used a lot of uh, Pinot Noir Gewürztraminer. Uh, everybody thinks they got to get their sugar high. <laughs> and it is, it's not right. There's a lot of wines that should be picked light earlier. Over in uh, Germany, they never picked the wines before, I mean, the Virch rear over in Germany is picked about 20. The Pinot Noir, if they get their wines up to 21 or two, they're very happy. Mm. And they feel their startle doesn't get so ripe that it's, they're harsh. And that's, some of them are learning it and some of them have not. And lot, there's, a, there's a lot of people that have finally figured out. People don't want just to have a wine. They like a wine that's palatable and earlier. And uh, they lose so much wine when they try to har age it in oak barrels. I don't know, what are they losing, about 8, 10 percent? <laughs> I'm not sure. It's quite a bit, it shrinks in the barrel, hmm. but it also gets rid of a lot of acid. <laughs> and there are new bed eating there. And what are the best wine varieties grown here? Well, I found the two was Pinot and Verts for my area. Uh, there's a couple other ones that they're white wines that I've made some samples on some of them. Some of them are pretty good, but I never got into them because they were a little too early. They grew better across the river and up the river. Uh, one fellow in our area is growing grapes up at 2,200 feet. I don't know how. He's drawing, he's drawing them. They're not too bad. They're pretty good. I'll admit no, they were good, but uh, maybe it's more sunlight up at a higher altitude. You know, there's less. Mm -hmm. They grow a little different. But uh, that's the one that was put in by uh, how he died. We knew up there. Monty Austin. Oh, his Anne, his wife Anne. Yeah. What's her last name? Austin. Oh yeah, Austin. Austin. She lives. Doesn't live up there anymore. She hasn't lived up there for years. No, well, Anne hasn't. But, but he planted the vineyard up there, and he's doing pretty good. No, I don't know how. But because it changes very fast with the altitude here, and uh, there is some in spots that are growing them higher than I am, but they're staying mostly to that very early growing ones, and there, some are making pretty fair wines, and. Uh, I was lucky. <laughs> now it, yeah, I made some real nice Pinot Noirs in the Champagne. And uh, I also made a lot of uh, Rosé Pinot. It's a very popular wine now, the Rosés. Mm. Here. And uh, they have uh, it's real nice wines in this area and across the river in lower altitudes. 
I don't know how, how do you ever cross the rivers, how far altitude are they going? I don't know. Uh, well, yeah, yeah they, they, they raise, they, you know, there's vineyards up, uh, raised up in Parkdale, okay. way, but the, that's, well, those were, a lot of that area was similar to our elevation, I don't know, but, but there's, well, as I said, I know there's vineyards yeah, up in right. Parkdale, but they were, Parkdale was about some of the area, elevation of where we were. No, oh, that's higher than we were. Well, are. some, yeah, but sorry. not all. Their cherries usually came in when ours did. See, well, we're, we were about, the house is about 900 feet. I grew most of the grapes up around. About 1,200 was it? 1,000. Oh, but, but they're raising you up there at 2,200. I don't know how well, they're having a look. <laughs> well, there's a lot of a lot of new people in the yeah. industry. I mean, just just in the last few years, you know, the uh, the amount of growers and the amount of wineries on sure each that. side of the river have just multiply to the point where you, I mean, there's there many, some, many, many that I have not been to. I don't know, our daughter's coming Saturday and the granddaughter from Portland coming for, Elise is coming home for Father's Day from Seattle and, and they want to go wine tasting Saturday, Saturday, but somehow we always end up at her favorite wine reason don't get very far, so we'll see whether we're going to try any new ones Saturday or not. But yes, there's a lot of different, uh, a lot of different, well, there's just, I feel right now there are so many good, dry, r blended red wines. My experience the last year has been that I really prefer some of the blended red wines that are coming up over, over uh, Cabernets and flowers and wineries. Most of them are better than some of the really heavy wines. Well, what is it, one of the most important to learn, or if you had one to do over again, what would it be? Patience. <laughs>